uh, we can start now uh, a very good evening and a very warm welcome to all of you uh, on behalf of uh, the center for human rights studies at uh, jindu global university and on behalf of live law as well who is our partner in this uh, so today we have uh, today is of course a very aus auspicious uh, occasion uh, everyone they know there are hundreds and uh, thousands of panels being organized you know webinars seminars and all that that are being organized on the idea of constitution <laughs> on the idea of different aspects of the constitution how uh, you know we are sort of trying to take a look back on november 26 1949 and see what really happened how much we have uh, traveled we have been trying to examine different aspects of the constitution and that really brings us to our discussion today you can call it a discussion you can call it an informal chit chat but we do have a wonderful wonderful uh, panel with <laughs> very exciting speakers the theme the broad overarching theme of this panel is constituting gender equality and the constitution so i don't actually want to get into uh, uh, the you know into the sort of nitty-gritty of what this what the theme uh, is supposed to contain because i think that will be very clear as we start uh, uh, our discussion and open uh, open the uh, panel uh, but i do want to introduce our esteemed panelists uh, and our speakers and this is going to be the order in which uh questions uh, will be asked i will be your moderator for the evening uh, i am juma my name is juma sen and i uh, teach at uh, <coughs> jindal global law school uh, and i'm also part of the center for human rights studies uh, our panelists include uh, <coughs> justice moshmi bhattacharya from the calcutta high court and uh, she justice bhattacharya has a very keen interest in women's issues in gender justice uh, our next panelist will be dr kalpana kannabiran who also needs no introduction she is a sociologist uh, she is based out of hyderabad and who she is also i think i do not need to uh, say the state this she is also one of the most prominent scholars of anti discrimination law uh, we also have <coughs> advocate brinda grover who is an advocate at the supreme court and she too needs no introduction she is one of the most well known names amongst practitioners of criminal law and we do have anandita pujari dr anandita pujari is an advocate on record uh, practicing in the supreme court of india and she is currently also serving as the honorary general secretary of the bar association of india and she has some very interesting cases in her kitty which is which she is going to speak about uh, during the course of uh, our uh, discussion uh so the couple of uh, you know sort of uh, uh, rules uh, housekeeping announcements is that if you have any question just keep posting those questions in uh, you know in your in youtube or facebook instagram wherever <laughs> and towards the end we have like 30 minutes at the end of the panel uh that will be from that will start from about around 8 uh when we will take up those questions and we will uh, put those questions uh, to the panelists so if you have a question targeted or you know directed at a particular panelist please mention that and we will definitely take it uh, on from there so um without you know you know wasting more time because i think this is a this is a very exciting panel and uh, we you know we received a lot of uh, good response uh, on this i think i will direct my first question and my first question is <coughs> directed at uh, at justice uh, bhattacharya and uh, so my my uh, my question to her is that uh, on constitution day today is a constitution day uh, you know it <coughs> might be a good idea to sort of take a look back at the making of the indian constitution and in this process of making of the indian constitution we constantly hear about the forefathers who made and who contributed to this making of the indian constitution so how do we take a fresh look we look back and assess the role of our constitutional foremothers you know the the, uh, the constitutional foremothers and the role that they played in the making of the indian constitution so if justice patacharya would like to address that question i would be very honored and grateful thank you uh, juma for um, bringing us all together on this um, very important and significant day and a very good evening to all my um very distinguished panelists uh, dr kannabiran 
Ms. Grover, uh, uh, Ms. Pujari, uh, you all have done uh, seminal work in your respective fields. And I, I, I am sure I'm going to be very, I'm going to really enjoy your, your uh, individual discussions on this, um, on this uh, emotive issue. And why, why do I say emotive? I like the phrase constitutional for mothers. Not only does it strike um, an emotional chord, at least it does in me, but it's just that, um, you know, we, are, we have grown up reading about, knowing and believing that our constitution was a product of some extremely distinguished men. But little do we know and little did, at least I know, that the women had such a seminal contribution to it. And I'm really happy to be given this opportunity to talk about it because in the process of talking about it, I myself came across so many very interesting facts. So let me just um, uh, try to introduce some kind of a drama uh, into, the, into the talk, if I may, uh, and zip back to uh, December 1946, when a newly formed constituent assembly came together to debate and draft a constitution for um, an India which was just about to turn, turn the corner of independence. The debate, actually, the, the, the constituent assembly debate took place for over two years, 11 months, and I believe 17 days. And it was uh, actually an extraordinary project. It was an experiment that would determine the ability of uh, India as a country to govern itself. And among the 299 members of the assembly, there were 15 women who had um, either been voted or chosen to represent their respective provinces and um, who actually left their indelible mark on the constitution. The uh, assembly also gave them a platform to, from which they could assert their thoughts and their ideas on um, equality and how to craft um, a politically and a balanced constitution in terms of rights when it comes to gender. And, uh, it, you know, it's kind of, uh, uh, it's sad in a way that very little is actually known about these 15 women. They were, they came from all across the, um, the demographic. They were, they were freedom fighters, they were uh, reformists, uh, they were lawyers, um, uh, suffragettes. They, some of them had political backgrounds. Uh, they had done a lot of work in uh, women's organizations and uh, feminist movements. And uh, in fact, a lot of these women, and I'll come to them presently, they had um, uh, taken part in the Dandi March, in the SALT Satyagraha and uh, you know done their bit for the you know against the simon uh, commission and it is why do i say momentous because it is in this assembly that they raised their voice for minority minority rights uh, uh, against reservation against uh, uh, harijan uh, uh, for harijans against uh, discrimination of harijans and um, um, this one sec. um yes and it was it was really um, something um, uh, you know something something momentous because um, if you just give me one minute because I've um, yes uh, it was it was uh, something momentous because um, uh, these women came from all across the uh, the the divide so without much ado let me first uh, go into the uh, the contributors. Uh, who actually made a difference to the constitution which we know today. The um, first woman, and, and remember, apart from um, uh, Vijayalakshmi Pandit, apart from uh, Sucheta Kripalani, apart from the well-known women we come across, there were women who uh, came across from all over. And, and you know we really know little about them. So the first uh, woman I would really like to talk about is um, is Ammu Swaminathan. Uh, she was actually born into an upper caste uh, Nair family, uh, and you know how conservative they are. 
and uh, in the Palghar district of Kerala. And most of her life, she had fought against caste oppression, um, along with Annie Besant, along with Margaret Cousins, very well, well known women. And she actually contributed to fundamental rights and directive, uh, um, directive principles of the um, state policy. And, the, and she really kind of gave her seminal thoughts on this. The uh, next person is Annie Mascarell, who came from the Travancore and uh, Cochin province. And uh, her background was actually, uh, she was born into a Christian uh, Latin, a Latin Catholic family in Tiruvananthapuram and was one of the first women to join the Travancore State Congress and was, in fact, an integral part of the um, working committee of the Travancore State Congress. And how did she contribute? Uh, she brought forward the idea uh, of the right of people to elect their own representatives to the local body. Uh, and uh, particularly her thoughts were accepted for provincial elections which were um, which were taking place at that point of time. Then there was uh, Begum Aizaz Rasul, who came from the United Province, and she was uh, a Muslim. And why I make particular mention about her background is because it was really something remarkable. She was again born into the principal family of Malar Kotla, Punjab, and uh, was a and the only Muslim woman in the Constituent Assembly at that point of time who took part in the constitutional debates. And her first uh, entry into politics was actually as a secretary to her father, uh, with, uh, from whom she got her first training. And uh, her contribution, uh, I mean, remarkable, really, was uh, preservation of uh, civil liberties, preservation of uh, unique um, uh, groups, language. Um, then she also uh, fought for proportional representation then against acquisition of property by the state. And of course, um, before I forget, primary education in the mother tongue. Next was, of course, um, uh, we were supposed to have uh, uh, Dr. Veli who who, um, who uh, we sadly couldn't have. But um, Dakshani uh, Veli Udhan, she was, uh, she was famous for advocating um, uh, the, uh, the Clause 11 of the interim report which is fundamental rights, and particularly to freedom and freedom from forced labor, uh, which was, uh, remember, I mean, now maybe all these are very kind of, you know, talked about topics, but at that point of time, very uh, new and remarkable. Then there was uh, G. Durgabai Deshmukh from uh, Madras, who also joined the Indian Freedom Movement uh, at the at when she was 12 years old, actually and made uh, vital contributions because she actually went on to get a master's degree uh, while she was in prison. And she studied law later on in the University of Madras. And she, her contribution was for, for protection of women and children and uh, the youth. There, then there was, uh, you know, just to give you a very quickly, just to show you that, um, uh, just to impress upon the idea that the women came from all over. Then there was from Bombay, Hansa Mehta, very well known, I'm sure, to all of you. And uh, she fought for the universal, uh, for the Uniform Civil Code, uh, UCC, along with Vijayalakshmi Pandit, and worked on women's equality and human rights in the UN. Then there was uh, from the East, there was uh, Purnima Banerjee, uh, who was also a part of the Satyagraha movement and the Quit India movement. She was a close associate of uh, uh, Gandhi, uh, Mohandas Karamchad Gandhi. And she also held a port in the, uh, post in the Allahabad University, extremely um, educated women. Then there was Renuka Roy, again from Bengal. And she was a celebrated uh, women's rights and inheritance uh, rights activist. And uh, she really fought for religious minorities and uh, trafficking of women, prevention of trafficking of women. I mean, you know, um, and, and also against the Devdasi system. And when I was reading about her, it was really, uh, you know, uh, I was feeling that, I mean, these women, uh, at, you know, in 1946, to bring into, to force these ideas in the constituent assembly debates, that was uh, really remarkable. Then quickly, because I'll be overshooting the time, uh, Kamla Choudhury, Leela Roy, 
Maluti Choudhury, uh, Rajkumar Amrit Kaur, I must kind of put in a, she was educated um, in Ox at Oxford, um, uh, grew into a, or rather grew with Gandhian principles and um, uh, worked along with Margaret Cousins. And she really kind of um, participated in the Quit India movement and was the first health minister of, uh, of uh, independent India. Uh, and just to end my part with, uh, you know, uh, some of the things which I found to be kind of very exciting is uh, uh, I was reading one of some of the articles in Mint and uh, Wire where they've really uh, written about the contribution of these women. And um, I was I also read that um, a, a, uh, according to Aparna Basu, a scholar who was actually present in the parliament house when the transfer of power took place on um, uh, August 14, 15, 2008, um, uh, in, on August 14, 15, 1947, she drew attention to the tremendous courage and enthusiasm displayed by the members of the Constituent Assembly. And uh, uh, she writes, I, I quote, um, as we came out of the building, there were thousands gathered thousands of women gathered at what we now call Vijay Chok. And the enthusiasm of the people was unbelievable. Every one of us felt that we were embarking on a journey of building a new, independent and vibrant India. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is what was really extraordinary about these 15 women, and uh, which was actually also mentioned by um, Subhasini Ali, was that none of them were a proxy for anyone. I mean, they were not there because they were they were somebody's daughter or wife or 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 widow. They just came uh, forward to contribute their thoughts and ideas to a new India. And and remember, they came from conservative families, traditional families, but all of them knew the plight. They had experienced the plight uh, which uh, of Indian women. They had faced the 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 uh, violence and discrimination of uh, uh, Indian women through the centuries. They had read about it, the uh, bond issue of bonded labor. So this was, I think, uh, remarkable. And uh, yeah. the other, um, yes, uh, just to end. Uh, yeah, because, because it, it time's up, uh, you know. <laughs> yes. uh, sorry, yeah, I'm really, sorry, really, really, uh, really sorry to be a, uh, you know, be a uh, time not, people. Yes, uh, uh, I think I, I also became too enthusiastic, but yes. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to bring across the, the hope and the trust and the enthusiasm which these, which these women had. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think I will, uh, you know, move on. I was, you know, I was, you know, I was also engrossed. Uh, uh, I will just move on uh, and I'll, I'll shoot my uh, uh, second <laughs> question uh, to um, Kalpana. Uh, and uh, so th this is, uh, you know, I think, I, I think Dr. Kanabran is actually the perfect person for this, uh, and because um, now let's talk about the this transformative constitutionalism and the constitution's transformative goal, and <laughs> there is a lot of discussion around this. Uh, now, in this transformative scheme of the constitution, and uh, you know, how does one really historicize law as a site of uh, a cultural production, which has also <laughs> shifted and expanded? or perhaps understood the meanings and categories of sex and gender you know, in the judicial uh, discourse. And this is most acutely seen, perhaps, uh, you know, seen or observed in the Jawhar court. So, and what are the possibilities of you know, possibilities for future if one really looks at the you know, judgments like uh, Jawhar, for example, or even uh, uh, you know, Joseph Shine, for that matter, and uh, you know, <laughs> look at this. What really does the constitution's uh, transformative role in the in, in in sort of understanding or the the shifting categories of sex and gender? Uh, uh, I mean, how are these constituted? So that is my question to you. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Juma, and thanks for uh, getting me onto this panel. Uh, I I would just basically like to. Um, you know, start where you left off. Uh, I think uh, when you know when you say that uh, the Johar court actually uh, seems seemed to clinch a high point 
in the understanding of uh, sex and gender, uh, or even for that matter, Joseph Shine. Uh, I think what we really need to remember is that these cases come after a long line of cases uh, spreading over four decades that have interrogated assumptions about gender-based subordination, assumption, uh, the practices of women's oppression, uh, systemic and systematic violence against women across class, across community. So it goes back, in fact, to the 1970s, to the late 1970s. And that's where the struggle begins, to talk about bodily integrity, to talk about personhood, to talk about rights, to talk about violence against women, whether dowry or rape, in terms of Article 21. This has been the contribution of women's movements in this country. It has not come at the initiative of courts. And when we talk about law as a site of cultural production, especially, uh, you know, especially law that has upheld women's rights, notably against violence, uh, sexual violence and domestic violence, as also caste-based violence that, is, that takes specifically gendered forms, I think what we really need to, uh, you know, need to keep in mind and what we often lose sight of is the fact that these meanings shift and are shifted in the course of movement politics. They are shifted in the course of feminist mobilizing. The meanings are then imbued within practices or in interrogating practices by petitioners who bring these cases to courts. And that is, in a, in a sense, a political education of the courts, if you like. And so what we are seeing at the culmination of it, for instance, with, uh, and I wouldn't actually say Navte Johar is the pinnacle, I would start with Naz. I think that is where it is located. So even in tracing our genealogies, I think what, what one has to be very clear about is which is that first tipping point. And then what is it that then adds to that tipping point? So you have Nas, you have a pushback from Suresh Kaushal, but you also have, again, Putuswami and then Navdeh Johar. So I think that, you know, the, the movement, if you look at the movement from Nas to Navdeh Johar, you then sense, you get a sense of how vast the achievement has been to... Uh, to 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 uh, to reframe, not just to shift, but to reframe the terms of discourse. But having said that, and and also you know the the whole idea of only jurisprudence, yeah, Article 15, only on the basis of A, B, C, D, or any other. And courts for a very long time forget forgot that only and or any other are not the same thing. They mean completely different things. And this is something that I have argued, that while only can mean one category or any other, in fact includes the possibility of an intersectional uh, interpretation. But having said that, and having said that one actually sees a point where gender is no longer seen in terms of a binary, where it's no longer female or male, but you also have very ridiculous cases of, uh, you know, a... Uh, um, a, a, a female sister tutor who's actually a man because there were no fe eligible females available in, in gender-based jurisprudence, um, you, you see the acceptance that gender is not a binary of male-female, finally, with Nas Foundation. But even after Nas and after Joseph Shine and after Navdeh Johar, you still find that there is an extremely... Um, you know, conservative way in which the women's body is bodies are seen by courts. So there is a radicalism in terms of looking at gender fluidity and, you know, categories of gender beyond male and female. But it, when it comes to the rights of women for bodily integrity, you still have the old past sexual conduct. I and mean, we have so many cases. I don't need to recount them. But the conservatism of courts at different levels, both at trial and appellate levels, in, in uh, pushing women back into that traditional stereotype, 
while keeping gender fluidity and gender plurality alive is a contradiction. It's a deep contradiction that we haven't yet managed to fix, despite the fact that feminist organizing and organizing on, uh, uh, on women's rights has been the, for the longest time. Thank you. Kalpana really stuck to time. <laughs> I'm so happy. <laughs> OK, uh, so I think I will uh, you know, take this opportunity to ask uh, the third question uh, uh, of this panel to our third panelist, uh, and that is, uh, you know, that is Rinda, Advocate Rinda Grover. Uh, so my uh, question to Rinda is, Rinda, you have spent a lifetime working on and with women and other marginalized groups inside and outside the criminal justice system. Uh, <coughs> so I think this is probably a, a good question for you. So the idea of liberty, you know, which is is framed by the makers of the constitution and then which has been uh, substantially limited by the post-colonial state how does one really map this journey you know from the constituent assembly to the post-colonial masculinist state so what has been this journey this is my short question for you Rinda. thanks juma and first of all it's good fun to be on a panel which i believe the fact that this was an all women panel led to a lot of excitement on Twitter um, because it's an unusual thing to happen that women have something to say on something as profound as the constitution. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, of course, the topic that you've asked is uh, perhaps what people would do a PhD on, but I will attempt a very short answer and actually taking uh, forward some of the ideas that Kalpana has thrown in her uh, intervention. Uh, so if we were to look at the Constituent Assembly and we're looking at the concept of liberty, and I'm not getting into the, because liberty can be seen vis-a-vis -vis family, vis-a-vis -vis private sphere, public sphere. I'm looking more at liberty and state. So you've had um, the, the notion of a nation state and whether the nation state at sometimes a militaristic state, a masculine state, or perhaps in its most benign form, a paternalistic state. And that is uh, why I'm, I'm saying that there's an interconnect between the last intervention and this, because what we do see in court in the best form uh, is the paternalistic state that comes forward uh, uh, in, through court judgments and interventions. Um, if you were, if, it also would depend on your location. Um, whether the nation state at any time respected liberty and one would look at women and also women as a larger group of the demography they come from. So if it's a woman located in Kashmir, if it's an Adivasi woman, what did the, the notion of liberty hold for her? And as we know, at the time of partition, you had the Abducted Persons Recovery and Restoration Act passed in 1949. So what was the notion of liberty then? And how do we look at liberty today? So the location, whether the woman is uh, uh, the caste location, the, the uh, geographical location, the group location, all factors which would affect liberty, uh, including personal liberty. I would also like us to see women not just in their specificity, but see women as part of the, the, the movements and the agents of social change today, whether, and as we mark the 20s, the, the, founding day of the constitution, we also know that it marks today one year of the farmers' protest on the borders of Delhi. And a very large number of women from villages, uh, and I'm only familiar with what is happening in Delhi, uh, around Delhi, but I'm sure this is true to, for many parts of the country, a very large number of women farmers have been participating and women farm workers have been participating. So our notion of who is a farmer also um, has to be uh, uh, reconceptualized in many ways. Uh, whether it was the anti-CAA protests, uh, women again as leaders of social movements, as challenging unjust laws. Uh, and what happens to the liberty of those women? What happened to the liberty of, of uh, Adivasi activists leading uh, uh, campaigns for accountability in uh, Chhattisgarh? If we were to look at liberty in that sense, in today's uh, context of how the state and the courts are responding, then women are 
also at the receiving end of um, the restriction on free speech, the weaponization of criminal law, whether it is sedition or the UAPA, which is uh, people where uh, uh, women activists and women human rights defenders are being targeted, women journalists are being targeted and silenced. And I think we need to, therefore, even when we talk of liberty, we need to talk of women in, uh, in all these contexts uh, and how the liberty, the larger notion of liberty impacts women's lives directly, as well as the liberty that the woman seeks within the social space uh, the community as well as within family. And I just want to touch on one more, and I, I'm just flagging some of the thoughts that I uh, uh, wanted to put here. Uh, one other uh, thought that I, I just want to flag, and perhaps at another time we have an, a better, um, more complex discussion around it. Uh, it was mentioned about how uh, feminist movements have led to changes uh, particularly on the issue of violence against women. We very often nowadays hear about how uh, women seem to be in uh, uh, somewhere uh, aligned with a carceral state. And I think this is a misnomer. And there is a, a confusion here which perhaps needs a much more robust debate. Women's liberty is associated always, and that's why I took very diverse examples, with challenging notions of state power and the same patriarchal masculine state um, manifesting itse itself in the home and in the family. The challenge here really is to power, which uh, uh, can, can come in diverse forms and can uh, impose all forms of violence uh, on citizens, on women's bodies, whether through uh, a communal riot or through uh, Dalit atrocities against Dalit, the Hathras case, for example, uh, and how state power then uh, aligns with the dominant caste even to uh, not let the body be uh, cremated with any family uh, and social rituals that they believe in. So the, the notion of the state and women's liberty can never, the state power and women's liberty can never come together. And uh, when we talk of the carceral state, I think we have to therefore see groups which are oppressed and marginalized would be against the carceral state. The confusion being created with the power of the state to use opportunities and to use selective opportunities of, uh, um, of, of uh, uh, taking forward its own agenda through certain cases of women. And you were, you know, so take the example of death sentence, for instance, in the Nirbhaya uh, gang rape case. It is really how the state is deploying those occasions to further accumulate its own power. And it does not in any way lead to women's uh, uh, liberty. And the feminist movement has been perhaps the strongest opponent of the death sentence in this country and the most consistent voice against it. So I think when we look at uh, uh, things from the outside rather than be part of, of these processes, we would perhaps then be able to untangle where, how and uh, how the power of the state uh, is exercised over women's bodies and used and manipulated and presented in a certain way, but does not in any way enhance women's liberty. Thanks, Rinda. You're also you know, right one minute over time but that's fine and i actually want to uh, ask you a question uh, you know on on this process bit uh, later but I, I want to move on to our uh, fourth speaker and uh, she's a very dear friend and uh, and she's also in some of you i, mean, I think everyone on the panel knows uh, but this is for the audience uh, who may not be aware of this the supreme court in 2018 uh, opened a fresh facility uh, and this was pursuant to directions in Anandita Pujari versus <coughs> Supreme Court of India uh, through the Secretary General. So this is the uh, citation and this is actually widely understood as a step long due and in a step in the right direction to engender the court premises. So my question, my first question to Anandita is of course uh, premised on, on you know on this uh, on this judgment which uh, 
uh, you know, which uh, which in a sense of historic judgment and which he was uh, very instrumental in this. Uh, so as a <laughs> petitioner, can you speak a little about this journey and the continuing challenges? Because now we have a question in the Supreme Court, but what are the continuing challenges? Because I'm sure there are many. Thank you, Juma. Thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, I'm in fact uh, glad and extremely grateful to you for uh, discussing the issue of Kresh because uh, I think for the first time uh, that uh, somebody is talking about it in a public forum uh, on the Constitution Day. And I'm really, I think that's a big achievement in itself uh, because uh, till today, the journey of having a Kresh in Supreme Court, uh, it has been a very, very lonely journey. Uh, be it uh, at the stage when I thought of uh, filing uh, uh, public interest litigation, be it at the stage when the Supreme Court filed an affidavit on record uh, saying that it's a private interest litigation and I have no locus and the cited few judgments saying why I have no locus to file the public interest litigation, having paragraphs after paragraphs in the affidavit explaining as to why under the constitutional law, it's just not permissible for me to say that not having a crash facility is not violation of my rights. It's not discrimination on the basis of 15. So uh, it was, uh, so all those arguments were quite alien to what I had studied in law school and what I always believed as a lawyer. Uh, but as a part of the process, we had to, you have to go through that entire process to achieve something. So, um, for the first time, it's no more a, lo a lonely battle. I feel uh, from today, everybody else is going to take this battle forward. So thank you for that. Now, coming back to the journey. Uh, yes. So when I came to Supreme Court and uh, <clears throat> started my practice, I was already married. I had a um, daughter. Um, every time I have to enter the courtroom, I had to leave her in the uh, garden area. And as you know, we don't have very, really big trees uh, where I can, where there is shade or something of that sort, where I can leave my daughter happily and feel safe about it. So I had to have my domestic help or any friend. And you have all these friends in the bar. Those are always willing to help you while you are young and enthusiastic about your practice. So I had no choice to leave my practice. I was very passionate about it. Uh, I had also, as a child, uh, uh, experienced the feeling of being in the court uh, uh, corridors of the prison. I used to accompany my mother to court. My mother, who was a practicing advocate and the first women advocate of entire Western Odisha, she was a public prosecutor as well. And in the 70s, there were no crash facilities. The thought wasn't there at all. So I remember as a child visiting court premises with her many a times in her lap uh, while she is still arguing a matter. Uh, so when I had to do the same thing, go through the same experience as a lawyer, I found it very tough. I thought, how, how is it possible that I can argue for everybody else, but never can stand for myself? Where is my 191G rights? And who is going to protect it unless I stand for myself? So with that thought, I always wanted to file uh, a public interest litigation and ask for the facility. In the meanwhile, uh, during my search, I did find that many people had also represented to the Supreme Court, but including uh, Ms. Indra Jaising, but... Uh, uh, the crutch wasn't established. Finally, the uh, what really made it happen was uh, I was part of the NJSC case as well. Uh, so the NJSC case, suddenly one fine day, the bench decided that we'll hear the matter all through the summer break. And I was already finding it quite difficult to handle the child, uh, leave her in the lawn area, go inside the courtroom, argue the matter and come out and somehow handle her quickly. So uh, when the court announced that it will go have the hearing during summer vacation, as if, you know, I just didn't know how to handle the situation. And I did speak to so many senior advocates and, you know, all the doings of the bar appeared in the matter. And uh, so I spoke to many of them that isn't isn't it a little unfair to a women lawyer? Because in that case, somehow not too many women lawyers were appearing. And uh, from the petitioner side, we were just one or two. So I did uh, uh, I did request, but uh, hardly any response. Uh, so. And in the middle of that summer break, I had to attend the court proceeding and I got this court notice saying, so the we are going to inaugurate the crash. So I said, okay, where is it? Let me go and check. And when I checked, I found a very tiny room which had no ventilation at all to be. Uh, so a signboard was going to come up and in a few days time, it was going to be inaugurated as Supreme Court having a crash. I found it a little strange and straight away without a second thought decided to challenge it. So I filed a red petition, which ultimately, which went on for three years. And finally, the crash got inaugurated. 
I know my time is up. Uh, just two minutes are left. But very quickly, I'll just say, what are the achievements that I could have? I, of course, in the journey, I had many with me. I had Miss Jai Singh, who uh, very willingly agreed to appear pro bono. We also had Mr. Siddharth Luta appearing for the Supreme Court. And uh, the Supreme Court initially was quite reluctant. As I said, they filed an affidavit saying why I cannot be filing the case. But later on, as the journey progressed, we had everybody so very convinced that the journey is worth it. And we had we used to have multiple meetings with the Secretary General, with the registrars of the court, with the advocate for the Supreme Court and all of us sitting together and pl planning out how the credit should come out. And finally, when it got inaugurated, everybody was happy. And what we could achieve was uh, what uh, very quickly is the court wasn't willing to issue notice in my writ. After three hearings, they said we will get informal comments from the registry. So I have got informal comment. And after a while, I have got a formal affidavit, so to say. And uh, the informal comment, of course, uh, uh, when it got admitted finally, they only limited it to two issues. The issue of fee, because I wanted the court to uh, recognize the fact that crash facility is a must. Unfortunately, that question has still been kept open. It is chargeable in Supreme Court. And on the ground that people should feel that they're participating in the process. My idea was to recognize that it is your obligation to provide for a crash rather than make people feel participating in the process. But I'm happy the question of law is kept open. So someday maybe it's a battle for another day. The other thing that I could little bit that we could achieve, we could make it a little more inclusive. Initially, it was only for the officers of the court and SCBM members. We could include the registered clerks, children also. But what the barrier that we couldn't break is it is not a women's job alone to take care of the child. Because when the registered clerks were allowed, the order said only women registered clerks' children are allowed. I still find it very strange. I'm not able to reconcile with it. So there are few <laughs> barriers that I could break. There are few that still remain. And the battle is on. I'm happy from now on. It will be for all of you to actually join hands with me and take it forward. Thank you. Sorry, Juma, for exceeding the time limit, but the journey is too exciting for me to. I can, I can, I can see, I can see that. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I think, I think we'll make up uh, in the you know, second round of questions, uh, and I'm going to be really strict, uh, uh, you know, with keeping with reference to keeping time. So my, so very quickly, <laughs> I'll come back to our, uh, you know, uh, to Kalpana uh, for uh, you know the second round of questions, and. Um, that is to sort of complicate this discourse of uh, uh, feminism and law and feminist use of law. So women's groups in India have time and again, they have resorted to law to articulate their right, <laughs> rights. And uh, this relationship, you know, I think it's, it's, it's very commonly known now, this relationship with using law or using courts has not necessarily been an easy journey. And it is also further complicated by the fact that Indian feminism has largely been an upper caste dominated feminist uh, uh, movement and practice. So what do you think has been the relationship between women's movement and law? I mean, and courts as well. And do you think that we have relied too much on law and stunted other transformative uh, possibilities? So Kalpana, you can, you can. You can yeah. go and answer this. Um, well, you know, I uh, on uh, the engagement of women's movements with law, uh, there are several, several levels of engagements. Yeah, But if you look at the first campaigns, it was not an option. You know, you're talking about custodial rape. You are talking about dowry murders. You're talking about aggravated domestic violence. Uh, these are not matters where any women's group can exercise a choice of whether or not to go uh, engage with courts uh, or whether to try something else that is more transformative. Because here the engagement with courts that were largely male, for the most part misogynist, was part of the transformative agenda. It was to lay claim to the space of courts as belonging to women who were surviving or being, uh, you know, or or or, uh, or being killed uh, by sexual violence and other forms of violence within the family and without, yeah. So I I wouldn't actually say that the engagement with law has stunted 
other forms of uh, you know other, uh, other other forms of mobilizing and this is not only to do with uh, with women uh, you you will find it in almost every uh, you know every area for instance uh, since you also raised the issue of caste uh, let's look at the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes prevention of atrocities act it is an engagement with law it is an engagement with the constitution with the constitution it is it brings directly into play article 17 rights but it is important it is an important part of social transformation to 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 bring a law like the prevention of atrocities act you know uh, you are dealing with a caste supremacist society so how can the liberation or how can the annihilation of caste even be possible if you don't have, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a very stringent criminal law regime that, uh, that, that aims at disciplining caste supremacy? You know, how, how do you discipline? Brinda earlier raised the question of power. The point is, how do you discipline power except with recourse to law? You, you discipline power through political mobilization, through public mobilization, for sure. But part of that public mobilization is engagements with and through courts. The second part of your question on, uh, you know, on, on the question of uh, the feminist movement being upper caste, you know, I actually find that really very problematic. I, I find that's, you know, uh, that bold statement rather problematic because I think what you're also assuming is a kind of a monolithic movement. As, as far as I'm concerned, uh, if you look at the earliest cases uh, of sexual violence, they had to do with the rights of uh, Muslim women, of Adivasi women who were being targeted because they belonged to those groups. It was not simply a Mathura or simply a Ramizabi. There was certainly a very, very communal angle to the way in which they've been targeted. You look at Hathras recently, you find the same thing. You look at Kairlanji, you find the same thing. So the, 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 the recognition is there that women across, are, you, know, uh, you know, women exist across class, caste, community, and that there are specificities in gendered experiences of violence and oppression between these castes, castes and co communities, it's not the same experience. There has been an acknowledgement of that. There has also, I think, it's also important to recognize the long history of mobilizing that Dalit women and Muslim women have actively engaged in. Actively. Since the early 1990s, at least, I know that Dalit women have organized as Dalit women to actually fight discrimination, both in the public sphere and to fight discrimination within the women's movement. In terms of the women's movement itself, the issue of majoritarianism, the issue of a majoritarian and caste supremacist domination has been constantly raised and critiqued within, I can't forget, for instance, Flavia Agnes's critique in the Jadavpur conference, but also, you know, that, that, that there have been uh, articulations and mobilizations of, feminis of feminism and women's rights in different spaces. To say that the women's movement is upper caste is to completely ignore the fact of the diverse locations and the diverse articulations of feminism and to give priority to one, what, one so-called mainstream uh, you know, uh, uh, trend alone. And I wouldn't actually do that. You know, I think one needs to look at the ways in which and the ways in which critiques have actually been launched in terms of caste, in terms of class, in terms of community, in terms of tribe, importantly, where women's rights are concerned. And these questions have been part of the larger struggles as well as part of women's articulation that is quite separate from those large struggles and quite separate from what you understand uh, as you know this upper caste or dominant caste 
uh, mainstream feminism. So I do think that just as we are recognizing, you know, the plural spaces of mobilization and the plural interrogations of power, we need also to think about what are the specificities of experiences that each of these mobilizations then bring to bring to the fore. And uh, 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 to kind of add one point to my last question, to my last, um, you know, uh, input was is also the fact that in talking about struggles, since you started with Navtej Johar, in talking about struggles, what you're also saying is that within each of these different movement spaces, the articulation of queer rights has been stronger than ever before. So what you have is a proliferation or a cascading of movement politics. And I wouldn't like to dovetail it into any one mainstream agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Kalpana. I think uh, I, I, th I think thank you know thank you for allowing me to be provocative and you know get this wonderful wonderful response uh, you know from you. Uh, I, I will actually now move to Rinda because I I'm, I'm mindful that we are uh, a little uh, short of time. Uh, <coughs> Rinda, you spoke about the idea of processes. We were talking about processes, and you know I. Uh, I think I you know <laughs> cut you short. Then uh, I actually wanted to uh, sort of you know wanted wanted you to uh, speak about that idea a little more and perhaps uh, also uh, you know discuss or you know uh, speak to the audience uh, uh, you know just to understand if is there at all a space for gendering you know criminal law uh, through our constitutional framework because we're we're talking about a lot about the carceral state and the idea of liberty and, uh, uh, you know, and the idea of uh, gender. So is there a space and what would that space really look like? Uh, certainly, Juma, I think uh, actually these, these, no, uh, these ideas and notions when they are going to interface and interact with each other, uh, a lot of the answers are emerging from it. And it's important that these answers come out of those processes rather than uh, any answers that anybody has already out there. And I would say that actually we, we, are, we are already in that process where criminal law, the process of criminal uh, legal system uh, is being impacted. I'm not saying it's changed and it's not going to, uh, uh, there is a lot of resistance, the resistance from, uh, uh, from the state, from the system itself which is embedded in uh, deep-rooted uh, cultural notions of patriarchy and misogyny, which we take as common sense within our criminal legal system. But this uh, interface is jostling that. Uh, to take examples of, uh, you know, you see the courts coming out very strongly and, and, and with language which would, uh, uh, you know, to convey when they are um, punishing for a woman who has been uh, raped or assaulted. But if one looks closely and examines, and you one saw the same thing through cases much, which were much more uh, uh, closely scrutinized on cases of dowry death, cases of uh, harassment, uh, mental or physical cruelty within the matrimonial home. And now, particularly with respect to sexual violence, the, the victim, which seems to be the woman victim, which seems to be deserving of uh, justice from the court, uh, is that uh, completely helpless, hapless, but uh, uh, someone with almost no agency, who has not herself uh, expressed sexuality, expressed agency, has uh, um, her own ideas of what she should or should not do with her pri private and public life. Those women are still seen as most deserving of the wrath of the criminal legal system, rather than women who are uh, through the legal process. And I say this because today, the, the women who, who one accompanies to court today are actually going to court with a very different understanding. They are not going there because they think the court is, is going to take one. They don't want the pity of the court. They don't want the pity of the legal system. She is going there as a citizen and she is saying, I have been wronged, therefore you need to intervene. And I think that 
change which has taken place in the minds of of women and women to assert their citizenship and to assert their their conviction of their equality is very deep rooted now and that is the assertion that is being made which is compelling the courts and is pushing the courts and we've seen that in recent judgments where the court has been compelled to comment on the the attorney general was uh, 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 filed in the skin to skin judgment <coughs> or the earlier parna bhat judgment where in fact literally the supreme court has written a set of directives on how to understand uh, women and not the notion the notion of women that is passed down so i think we are at a very interesting stage and again to reiterate what has been said by kalpana and in some ways by anandita where is this change coming from it's coming from the movements where is the change coming from it's coming from the large number of women in the legal system as practitioners whether in the bar or on the bench all of them are compelling this change and that is the i i think that's the best way forward and while judgments like put on me etc may underline the larger concepts for them to translate uh, to take one example uh, the right to privacy is being seen in decisional autonomy uh, in procreation etc and look at the the law relating to abortion and we still have on the indian penal code um the uh, uh, provisions which make even voluntary and therefore uh, a, a voluntary uh, abortion a crime unless it is done through the mediation of the abortion law so we do have today benchmarks that have been set and there are processes underway and i would imagine that these processes will uh, over time compel uh, the courts uh, the judiciary and the entire legal system to revisit uh, justice to women not as daughters and sisters who are being handed out justice we don't need a knight in shining armor we are going <laughs> there to state our rightful claim thanks rinda i was just about to say that uh, you know times up i was also looking at the comments and making a note so i forgot uh, um so I, yeah so uh, the i think this this question is uh, uh, you know directed at uh, <coughs> both uh, 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 justice patacharya and uh, uh, anindita and rinda can also jump in if she wants to uh, so th this is i mean this question is to do with the bar and the bench and the question is that how can our courts be made more equal spaces or feminized uh, in some <coughs> tangible ways that is to say that what will the everyday life of equality in practice look like for women members of the bar and the bench and when i may, I, when i say women members it's not just women members but women members and women and other members including transgender persons so what will it look like Um, can I can I start uh, and will uh, yes. Anindita? Yes, I, I think just just Acharya can start and then maybe Anindita can follow. And if Brinda wants to jump in, she's also hmm. welcome. Uh, well, uh, Juma, I think it's interesting that uh, you you use the phrase uh, equal equal space, because uh, I would preface my answer to that question by saying that uh, Constitution now has been seen as a transformative document. where uh, women uh, may not essentially be uh, straight jagged into one particular segment i think that was justice chandrachur in uh, one of his uh, decisions um, and if you uh, what i always kind of found interesting is that despite this the commonly recognized articles you know 14 15 16 uh, uh, 21 etc uh, 19 etc the constitution has recognized our constitution has recognized that there are there, there is a requirement for certain articles whether it is uh, 42 talking about maternity uh, benefits or 51 um, uh, e which talks about uh, you know that you can't uh, 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 pr against practices uh, which are derogatory to women or 243 uh, d uh, etc you know which talks about reservation Uh, even when we talk about equal spaces we must recognize that uh, even within those spheres of equality we need to create spaces which are um, which are more equal 
than the others or which receive some sort of a focus because it's women. And when we treat women um, uh, as the same or at par with men, when it comes to the bar and the bench, uh, I think um, we would probably need to revisit that, that idea and uh, recognize that for women, you need to focus on certain rights and certain um, and, and preservation of those rights for uh, to reach that level of equality, uh, which I think we we constantly kind of lose sight of. Um, and uh, when you talk about uh, if I were to address the question on equal spaces, I would uh, essentially divide it between, of course, the mental uh, uh, the the mental set, the mental uh, makeup. But more importantly, uh, the infrastructure which kind of allows for that, uh, for creation of that equal space. Now, whether it is, as uh, Dr. Pujari said, about whether it is uh, creche or it is medical facilities or it is, uh, you know, sanitary napkin dispensing machines which are located conveniently for women to access, uh, to have access to, um, uh, you know, we should also really ensure. Uh, some fora which would preserve, uh, uh, you know, these basic rights of women. For example, career counseling facilities. I mean, you know, we must recognize that there are women who come um, as first generation lawyers without any infrastructural support. Uh, uh, you know, they come by public transport. They don't have a, a relative in the profession. Um, uh, you know, they, they don't have the resources to even, uh, uh, you know, buy a decent lunch uh, in court or they don't have a place to sit. Uh, they don't have a place to keep their uh, uh, papers or even their gown Their uh, no, you know, okay. so they just kind of use the common spaces and they don't even know when that will be kind of, you know, uh, uh, somebody will just come and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, whether they will be secure in those in those places. So. Um, we need a career counseling forum. We need uh, experienced people, committed people who would counsel women as to whether you know they should continue to remain and fight it out yeah. as counsel mm -hmm. or they should try their luck elsewhere, uh, a, solicitor, a solicitor's office, law firm, or whether the legal profession is not at all for them. So, I mean, women just kind of, you know, uh, 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 they kind of instead of wasting time aimlessly at the bar when you know somebody can actually guide you. Two uh, very important, I think, that we should have a forum where women can go for uh, you know sexual harassment complaints or any kind of harassment may not be sexual. So it must be a forum with, uh, as, as I said, committed people, uh, people who are I would say one step higher than the uh, practicing advocates, so that. Um, if a complaint is actually to be addressed, then uh, you know the 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 uh, the accused, if I may use that word, uh, can really kind of look up to the committee and uh, make sure that um, you know uh, proper redress is done. And uh, the third, I would say, infrastructure-wise, is uh, democratization of chambers, where women would actually uh, not have to uh, you know fight against. Uh, 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 men and women who, who know senior lawyers, who have access, who have their contacts. So <coughs> women know that very well. If I come to the profession, I can be attached to this particular kind of chambers who do my particular work or, you know, my, my kind of who operate in my areas of interest so that they actually know that uh, there is a future a promise and there is uh, uh, a space where I can kind of operate and I have something to look forward to. So apart from infra infrastructure, I think these are the three uh, fora which uh, really need to be created and maintained with some sort of a quality control and standard so that women uh, don't feel that, you know, they're kind of, you know, they, they don't have anybody to go to in case they have a serious issue. Thank you. Dhuma, if I can just yes. uh, come yes. here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you talked about having an equal space. I was just wondering, uh, what do we really mean about it? Because uh, being a practicing uh, lawyer, I think the first task uh, that you have to excel, actually learn and then excel, is uh, how to navigate the courtrooms. The court corridors and the aisles in the courtrooms are so narrow that you really do not know what is a bad touch, what is a good touch, uh, 
uh, whether you require any such kind of touch at all. Uh, I'm putting it very candidly and very upfront manner because being a practicing lawyer, we do navigate these issues on a daily basis and find it absolutely offending, but can do can hardly do anything about it. We do raise complaints. We do uh, uh, tell our seniors. We do uh, meet the officers in the court and say, can anything be done about it? I still remember there was a registrar's courtroom in Supreme Court where it was absolutely impossible to enter the courtroom. Thankfully, the situation has changed now. The registrars have got better spaces where mostly the junior advocates visit because it's mostly compliance's job. So uh, I'm happy things are changing. But one first thing, uh, you know, the physical as well as mental space need to change. First thing is the court corridors where you don't have to either elbow out anybody or, or being elbowed out at all. And I can walk freely because since we are talking in the context of constitution, so I think my article 21 at least demands that I, I'm able to walk freely in court corridors without being bothered as to who is going to, you know, come from which side and, and whether I can walk freely or not. So that's one. Number two, I did talk about the crash. I think that's an absolute yes, and every court should have it. Because I think court as a workplace has been recognized more so after the uh, sexual harassment prevention codes have come in. I think it is not needed anymore to explain to anybody that courts are workplaces. And we do need to respect those spaces. And we do need to provide facilities that every other workplace need to provide to any other women. So I think that's number two. Number three, uh, I think uh, toilet facilities. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm actually bringing very, very mundane and day-to-day -day, uh, issues, but that's really the real issue. Uh, I don't know how many of you do realize. I know Juma would definitely know and Ms. Grover would also know that the Supreme Court uh, Law Officers Corridor where the Attorney General for India and the Solicitor General for India have their chambers still do not have a toilet facility for women. Maybe we never thought that the women would reach that level. But I'm sorry, I think women of today, uh, they are definitely aspiring to be there. So we better have it quickly. Uh, so, and besides that, forget about the Supreme Court, even other courts. I think there was a survey that was carried out two, two, three years ago where it was found that more than hundreds of district courts do not have toilet facilities. And even if they have it, it's not functioning. So how do you expect me as a, as a lawyer, a male or female, irrespective of my gender, to be not attending to the nature's call and attending to a matter in a more, very effective manner? I think it's just impossible. Now coming to the next infrastructural issue, uh, I think uh, the court as a space, um, it gives us justice, right? So it has to be aspirational. Aspirational in terms for for the litigant as well as for the lawyer, that I'm going to get justice here. And if we truly believe in it, there is no difficulty having a hall of uh, fame or a, a wall of fame really to have portraits of women lawyers, uh, those who have contributed to the field of law. Because uh, unfortunately, as you, I think the situation must be same in all courts of the country. When you visit the courtrooms, you only file male portraits as if, as if, the women's were missing and they never contributed anything. I find it absolutely strange. So it's high time we have walls where we actually put portraits of women lawyers, those who have contributed to the development of law so that every young lawyer entering the courtroom or the premises of the court feels a space to be aspirational and thinks of achieving something big or contributing to the system. So in terms of infrastructure, yes, I would like to see that wall where I can see portraits and feel proud about it and aspire to be one of them. In terms of other facilities, I think uh, Justice Bhattacharya has already mentioned about the sanitary napkin vending machines. Uh, till very late, we did not have it uh, in Supreme Court. Very lately, in one of my matters where the cost was imposed on my clients, we were very happily along with the Bar Association and the SCORA secretary that time. We suggested the court, why not? Why not if the client ultimately is paying money, why not actually divert some amount? few lakhs of rupees for having sanitary napkin vending machines and we could get it installed in ladies bar room in uh, in uh, um, in the next to the litigants canteen so that the litigants can access and also for the registry staff so we try to look into uh, all the stakeholders and so that's another infrastructural thing that can easily be provided for and i know i, I don't think i'm asking for more so <laughs> these are some of the infrastructural issues that can definitely be addressed Another thing that really um, uh, can be continued right now, we have developed, we have spent crores of rupees to de develop the hybrid system. I think the hybrid system is working well for the elderly, for uh, not so 
for for uh, people especially in delhi i can say we are we are suffering because of smog so if you don't feel like calling us and you know, if you think it's too uh, feminizing the issue if you ask people to work from home especially women and we are trying to give them a concession don't do it please call us environment warriors we are reducing your carbon emission we are happy working from home if i feel like attending to my child and doing it so please call it by whatever name it doesn't really matter but do help people trying to work from home because we have spent a lot of money on developing the hybrid system so let that continue so these are some of the infrastructural issues on the issue of mental space and with that i think I conclude because i've got a long list of demands that i would look forward to for being implemented and the last thing is when i speak as a lawyer i might be a little loud but please don't call me a noisy lawyer because i think when men do argue in a very very high decibel um tone you call them articulate lawyers so i would rather be preferred being called as an articulate lawyer than a noisy lawyer so if that thing fits into the mental frame then i would be grateful and i'll be truly obliged and with that i think i reserve my further comments for some other day thank you so much uh, dr pujari if i can interrupt i think the last allegation was against the bench is it uh uh it was uh, not an allegation it was definitely for the bench as uh, uh going back to what kalpana just said sometimes we do believe in educating and just to give an example uh in one of my matters on panchayati raj ordinance challenge from rajasthan where brinda and i were working together on the new year's eve trying to challenge an ordinance we had uh gifted a copy of hind swaraj by mahatma gandhi to the bench knowing fully well that it may not be uh, read before the judgment is written or the matter gets concluded but we thought it worth to present that book so i think it's always uh, uh, when i have an opportunity to have a judge like you why not ventilate and ventilate freely thank you a uh, rather a noisy judge noisy judge <laughs> oh i am happy i am absolutely <laughs> happy to to uh, have a noisy judge noisy is not a bad word just that it should be added with articulate as well no, no, that was just, that was just in jest thank you thank you i think rinda rinda is you know wants to wants to jump in yes rinda I your wish i have got such it. a splendid charter that i should just add two more bullet points and so that anandita's charter can then go ahead for publication uh, and this is again something that i know is uh, is something that anandita and i have been working together on on many of these cases so uh, as was mentioned earlier we had the 1997 vishakha judgment then we had the law coming in uh, in 2013 and the supreme court actually made the committee only in 2014 when supreme court women some of the women lawyers of the supreme court petitioned the supreme court to remind it it did not have a committee in the supreme court on sexual uh, harassment at the workplace while we do now have a committee and it's a functional committee uh the matter of sexual harassment by judges uh is a real one there are real complaints anandita and i have been doing some of these cases together and uh, that vacuum remains it's an institutional gap and i think it's important for these institutional gaps which directly impact on gender equality on our right at rights at our workplace are filled these petitions are pending what we call uh, amongst ourselves vishaka part 2 it's been pending for very long and i think it's very important for the judiciary to uh, ensure that mechanisms of redress and accountability are there uh, including for the judiciary juma if you can just clarify one particular fact uh when uh when uh, rinda did talk about uh, the supreme court regulations just uh, just a little fact that uh, the case was really that some some uh, women lawyers had complained that in delhi high court somebody was peeping into the women's loo and that in is how the court court and, and yeah and, and then this all turned around and this so this was, was a man fell exactly so it it wasn't a matter where the court consciously decided to look into the issue as to why there are no regulations but it was really a, an incident where a man was peeping into the women's loo in delhi high court and then and then this lawyer 
figured figured out that you know someone was actually staring and she turned back and this man you know just fell down and he ran and then there was a lot of commotion so and then there was the the, the bar uh, moved and there was a there was a petition <coughs> okay um uh, i think uh, you know i've i've not laughed so much in ages <laughs> this last part was completely you know i mean it was it was quite funny uh, and i also have my wish list but i'm i'm not going to add on to that for for now because i think most of it has been covered and <clears throat> i will just uh, we have uh, 15 minutes to sort of you know wrap this up and there have been some questions and um, some questions are quite expected at least from the uh, from uh, you know the the manner in which this uh, went viral on twitter i kind of gauge some of these questions and i leave it in you know, these none of these questions are addressed to any particular panelist so i leave it to the panel to respond when whoever wants to respond can jump in uh, so <clears throat> the first uh, i mean many of these questions are interrelated so i'm i'm just reading some of these out what about the false cases initiated by women uh, this is one question uh, another question is supreme court term 498a as legal terrorism what about that what is your opinion uh, and an allied <coughs> analogous question is crime has no gender then even on allegations whole family <coughs> of husband has suffered uh, suffer by these gender bias laws uh, i think anyone can jump in and respond vinda do you want to respond 498 498 a uh, the this um, pet peeve continues and uh, we, we we are still actually waiting for evidence of what is called misuse of law uh, at least more than a decade ago when i was looking at some of this these cases and trying to analyze it what one found was that uh, women were turning hostile in court women were not coming up to give evidence and if you went to the back story of many of them it was social pressure it was exhaustion it was compulsion to compromise so that things could be sorted out outside the court so there is a range of factors so i've i've never understood what we mean when we say misuse does a case not um ending in conviction does it imply Uh, and that's the common sense meaning people usually take from this that if a case does not end in conviction it means that the person who lodged the case had filed a false complaint first of all what happens in a courtroom particularly in a criminal trial is uh, the court is deciding the forensic truth it's not the absolute truth it's only based on whatever evidence is there and whether it is uh, proved or not and that is what the court gets to decide uh, in so far as the supreme court talking about 498a as legal uh, terrorism well I, in supreme court's own words uh, it's not it's uh, supreme only because it's the final court it's not infallible it has uh, shown itself to be fallible before and that very judgment which said 498a is being uh, misused etc uh, was then set aside by the supreme court uh, a larger bench of the supreme court and that judgment which which uh, used this kind of language has no study has no footnote we don't know on what basis it was one particular bail matter in which these extraordinary uh, exaggerations were made and i think it actually speaks more to uh, uh, how bias lurks and how the court actually gets carried away without any material before it and it shows us more about how difficult it is for women to cross these myths and women's cases to cross these myths and stereotypes and get justice even from the apex court it does not reflect on what is happening on the ground uh i think if you if you want it's it's uh, something which was said very i think by indra jaising at one point when she said that how is it that the idea of misuse of law we uh, the uh, finger is always pointed at women the finger is pointed at dalit so these are in our society uh constituencies of uh, or groups of uh, people who have never had access to courts never had access to law or to justice when they are exercising their rights now the allegations of 
uh, um, and accusations of misuse is thrown at them. Uh, actually, if we were to do some data analysis, uh, the anti-terror laws across the country are amongst the most abused, misused, and for which people spent decades of incarceration before being acquitted. So, uh, and that is where powers are draconian in the hands of the state. So I think we need to reflect on these things and we need to talk from a place of, of evidence and not that it happened with my uncle's cousin and my neighbor's friend and that kind of uh, uh, anecdotal data which doesn't take us very far. Uh, if I can just add, add a line to what um, Vrinda said and to which I agree completely is that I, um, the, the misuse allegation or the misuse charge, uh, we should just be able to distinguish that it is probably at the stage of filing and not at the stage of decision making. So, the, you know, we should really demarcate between the two. And when a court decides whether um, a 498A is, uh, uh, you know, if it's a kind of correctly filed or whether um, the, uh, you know, the uh, penalty should be given under the section, it's not really uh, with a presumption that it's a woman's or it's a special provision. But it's it's absolutely to do with the evidence and with the material which is in front of a court. Uh, thanks, uh, both Rinda and Anastasia Bhattacharya. I will. Uh, there are a couple of other questions. Uh, I, I, uh, there is this question that I think perhaps uh, maybe Kalpana or Rinda or any anyone really uh, can take it up, and <coughs> that is what should be the path of law reform gender neutral law versus gender inclusive laws where lies the difference i think it's an interesting question anyone um, I, can, I can ask, uh, yes, ask uh, a couple of other questions as well and maybe you know we can go in any order whichever is uh, suitable <clears throat> okay there is another question which is kind of uh, allied to the first set of question that was asked, and that is where is equality? <laughs> Everyone is talking about women. What about men? Uh, there is one question specifically targeted at uh, <coughs> Justice Bhattacharya, and that is how gender disparity can be stopped in judiciary despite equal opportunity and constitutional guarantee. Uh, this is one. And for Anindita, <coughs> there is one question, and that is uh, uh on this per <coughs> the it's mis mentioned that i would like the panelists to talk about the functioning of committee formed under posh act in court itself the annual reports show completely different picture from reality <coughs> uh, there is another question uh, and i'll yes. ask that later yeah uh, i can i can take that question uh juma the one which you uh, mm -hmm. the the gender reducing gender disparity uh on the bench uh, well, um, just to start, whether it's the term judge or lawyer, it, you know, they are absolutely gender neutral terms. So we don't really qualify those terms by, you know, whether it's a, a, a woman or a man. But having said that, um, I am also against, you know, appointing a woman on the bench because, um, you know, she's a woman. So basically, I'm against tokenism. So uh, appointing a woman should also be completely on the merit, on merit rather, because that also takes care of other areas of criticism. Because if you um, if you are appointed on the bench because you're a woman and because there are not enough women on the bench at, or if on, uh, in that particular high court at that particular point of time, then, you know, it, it just becomes life. I mean, it makes life more difficult for that particular uh, judge concerned. And uh, but before if we kind of uh, take a few steps back, when a person is being um, assessed for appointment, several other factors, I think, should also be taken into account that the the uh, fundamental uh, mindset of the people who are making that assessment is the mindset of uh, uh, of of an assessment of a man at a, at the equal level of the woman 
so you kind of take certain things for granted that you know that person uh, has you know should have a certain amount of income and therefore should have had a certain amount of uh, uh, exposure um, uh, you know briefs to work on and therefore recommendations and you know uh, so that you know you have that requisite uh, level of income so what you don't take into account generally i mean i think things are changing now thankfully is that uh, that person may not have had the requisite number or the recommended number of uh, recommendations to act in matters to appear in matters and therefore to push the income level up so when you treat a man and a woman for considering to be appointed as judges you need to make certain specific or certain special um, i don't want to use the word concessions that's terrible but you know certain kind of factors which should be specially considered for women uh, that you know um, uh, that you know the the income level the exposure to cases the kind of cases which are done uh, but at the same time you know it should not be that the woman is being appointed because she's a woman but because not only merit but also i think uh, the the mental makeup of that person and how suitable that person is to be appointed as a judge on the bench you know how balanced uh, you know how kind of mentally uh, 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 the kind of stable uh, uh, how kind of attitudinally i mean attitudinally whether she is whether she is uh, suitable for that uh, for that post so i think uh, that is some something which uh, we need to think and we need to kind of push these changes very quickly i'm going to give a one line answer and then uh, kalpana can i think we are uh, uh, the terms that one is using perhaps we are missing out if we if we juxtapose gender neutral with gender inclusive i don't think these are contradictory terms perhaps what we could start looking at is gender specific because if a trans person's experience has to um or or uh, atrocity committed has to get any redress within the criminal legal system then the gender specificity of that experience will have to be incorporated into procedures into evidence rather than just make a facially gender neutral definition which i think uh, will not meet the purpose at all and so i would rather root for gender specificity than gender neutrality and through gender and gender specificity will be about creating protection for or allowing uh, uh, the the laws to incorporate all and just one small point on what justice bhattacharya said uh, uh, and i'm just uh, picking that sentence of yours where you said um, women should also be appointed on merit and i know i'm walking the tight rope here um uh, we we are assuming that everybody who's being appointed is on merit and therefore women should also join that club i'm not sure so you know if we are saying women should come in only with merit let's first make that and here when we talk of merit i there is certain discomfort i think what we desperately <coughs> need particularly in our higher judiciary uh is diversity of perspectives we need people from different contexts we are getting the kind of judgments which somehow uh, don't seem to be uh accommodating or uh, looking at people's lived experience because perhaps the pool from which this is coming the experience of disability the experience of trans the dis- uh, the the experience of adivasis where is that reflected and where is that diversity of perspectives we really need to complicate this debate on appointments much more yeah um very uh, briefly uh, joining in on that uh, juma on on the question and and three um, short responses on on the question of uh, women in the uh, judiciary especially the higher judiciary um uh, i would make a distinction between tokenism and representation and i think that representation is a constitutional goal so when we are talking about women's representation in the judiciary we are not talking about t- tokenism necessarily we are talking about representation how do you how how do you realize the constitutional goal of equality and non discrimination if if not in a uh, parity in numbers 
how can we say, for instance, I mean, uh, take the Putraswami bench. I mean, it's a very radical judgment. But how can you say that a nine judge bench, however radical that bench might be, that a nine judge all male bench is the best route to equality? You know, I mean, I think that there is a problem. I mean, the, the problem is not with the nature of cases that we are bringing to court, but the problem is certainly about the lack of representation on the bench. And this has actually been a concern even with uh, the UN CEDAW committee, for instance, that has time and time again raised the question of the abysmal number of women in the higher judiciary in India as a matter of concern, saying that the goal of equality under the constitution in India is defeated by the lack of parity of women in the judiciary and in government service. It, within government service, the police is notoriously uh, low uh, in comparison with the other services. So I think that these questions have been actually raised in terms of representation, because if we don't look at representation, then it seems as if everything that is already there is on merit. And we are assuming that everything that is not there or every body that is not there is not on merit. We don't know how many absolutely stellar and competent and uh, fantastic queer judges we would have because we haven't had any till, uh, till, till the recent, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know till, till, till the recent uh, recommendation. So we, you know, how do we know? I mean, till Justice Saurabh Kirpal has come, suddenly we recognize that, you know, here is a judge who is brilliant, who is good, who is competent. He's queer, but he's also brilliant, you know? So it's almost as if the acknowledgement of his brilliance and competence has to be balanced against the fact that he's queer. And I think that the, the point that Brinda takes about diversity is really an important point. How do we know how many queer lawyers, how many lawyers with disabilities, how many women lawyers are out there, very competent, but simply not recognized because of the blinkers that appointing authorities and governments have on, that there are all kinds of considerations that enter in obstruction, not necessarily in recognition, but in obstructing the appointment of people who have gained widespread recognition and, and are recognized to be in possession um, you know, of, of merit. So I think that that is really a very tricky thing. And I think that that you know, kind of constantly walking that tightrope between representation and tokenism is something that we need to do. But there is really no uh, escape from it. And certainly the escape can't be through the merit argument because in, in reservations, for instance, uh, mandated by the constitution for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, the constant stereotypical stigmatizing rhetoric we find is that you, know, you have to appoint people who belong to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, even though they lack merit. And that is, again, something that is completely not empirically grounded. I've been within the teaching profession. I've dealt with students and large numbers of students. And I can say that that is simply not empirically borne out that your social location determines your merit. So the merit argument is a bit of a slippery slide. And uh, so how do you then balance merit with recognition, with representation? You know, and, and all, all three uh, are, are very, very complex uh, you know, uh, aspects that we somehow need uh, to interweave together. And again, and, and lastly, on the question of whether it's gender neutral, gender plural, or gender specific, I think all of these terms translate, uh, are, you know, make a bridge. Uh, for instance, when Anandita was speaking as well, it's a bridge between, uh, uh, between judicial perceptions and judicial orientations, if you like, uh, that between jurisprudence and infrastructure, I actually don't see uh, that there's a huge difference between them. 
you know, for a long time, my gripe against the High Court uh, in, in, in Hyderabad was that you cannot go anywhere without steps. So it is completely, uh, you know, it, 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 there will be no consideration that the High Court has given to barrier free access to the court. So what, where are we talking about equality? There are no persons with disabilities on the bench. We're talking about one queer judge who has made it with, against great odds. We don't have people with disabilities on benches. Where are they? And if we're talking about in, uh, infrastructural facilities, we are talking about toilets. I remember my gripe in Hyderabad High Court was that, the first of all, that you have a ladies bar room and the general bar room is presumed to be the men's bar room. You know, if you have a bar association room, it is for men and women. But no, the men <clears> sit <throat> in the bar room, the ladies sit in the ladies bar room. And that is a problematic thing for me. To top it all, the ladies' bar room, when I visited it more than a decade ago, had a parda hanging in front of it. You know, so I think that there are many, many symbolic ways in which this is organized. And then if you're actually talking about, uh, about uh, queer struggles for justice, about equality, about transgender rights, then that translates into infrastructure. We're talking about toilets. We're talking about waiting areas. So how do we then see that infrastructural facilities address gender diversity, not merely having women's toilet facilities and uh, sanitary pad vendors, uh, vendors and crash facilities, but how do we expand the reach of that to talk about gender plural and gender diverse infrastructure as also completely barrier free access? And these are really the hugest challenges because they are completely directly linked to the constitutional goal of equality. They're not outside of that. Uh, Juma, if I can just uh, take uh, half a minute to kind of respond to both uh, Vrinda and Kalpana, since yes. uh, this kind of use of the word um, tokenism was kind of probably um, uh, not understood in the context which I meant uh, it and it was entirely it's entirely my shortcoming but you know just to explain that uh, when i say tokenism what i meant was that appointment of a woman to the higher judiciary should not should be seen in the context of not excluding somebody sure. whether it's a man or a woman who is worthy of that position so i would like to really push the equality concept there that uh, when somebody is being appointed to the exclusion of uh, when A is being being appointed to, ex to the exclusion of B, there should not be a, 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 a kind of a controversy that B was should have been in uh, where A is, but B has been excluded because B is not a woman. So, I mean, you know, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I am really very, I, I you know, kind of cautious about these controversies um, from personal experience also. So I think it just kind of guards against women judges, sure. uh, you know, for, for future controversies that, you know, you are there, but you are not really that good. And somebody else was better than you, but you got appointed. So my main thing is that as a woman judge, you will have to be so good that you know it's really kind of problematic but it's you have to be so good that nobody can raise a finger and say that you know you're you are there because you're a woman that that was my point yeah. Juma, if time permits can i just uh in one in last comment we are way past but just one minute i think just to just to uh somehow need the thread that everybody is talking about so um I feel neutral. I think we all know from our experience that neutrality need not necessarily lead to efficiency, not in economics, forget about law, which involves justice. So that's number one. Number two that I wanted to talk about is regarding the appointment of judges. Yes, we did hear our eminent panel on tokenism and representation <coughs> and the debate that, that, uh, that's around it. Uh, but what is really lacking is um, any, uh, there are two things that are lacking. One, there is no objective criteria as to why you you are fit to be a judge and there is also no informal mechanism to do any kind of study to understand the perspective of a judge 
because unlike other systems, other democracies, where you do try to at least understand what is the perspective of a judge, we just don't have that kind of formal or informal systems to look into it. Unlike, for example, what has been now introduced in cases of senior designation, where now there is a 100-point index. So at least there is seemingly an objective criteria uh, where uh, you have to have certain points to you have to score certain points and then only you you can be you can be considered for designation unlike in contrast to a voting system so i think we need to have both formal as well as informal structures and studies to know people those who are being considered for appointment for their perspectives and the most important consideration while doing such study is whether your thought process and your belief system is constitutionally compliant or not yes. if it is not then clearly you should be out and if you if and if it is then you should be in there is no reason why you shouldn't be so with that i think i conclude thank you thanks so dr pujari dr pujari is a real terrorist here <laughs> <laughs> I think I think Anandita will take it as a badge of honor. And, and Definitely. I'm for that. <laughs> Definitely, because uh, for me, only one thing that has stuck to my mind. Maybe I got very good constitutional law teachers. That every day constitution matters. It's of not course. a distant dream that I need to, you know, have every night. No, I need to enjoy it every moment. Yeah. I I know I don't know where to begin and you know where to end. You know we started talking about uh, ideas and then we really nicely moved to institutions and I think that really makes this panel uh, you know a success uh, and it is definitely a success going by the questions. You know I think there are uh, the the comments that have been you know, pouring in. Uh, there have been over hundred uh, comments, uh, uh, more than hundred comments and questions now. Uh, we are way past uh, the time that was uh, allocated to ourselves by us. So I would like to thank our esteemed panelists. Uh, and you know, this has been really, really good. And uh, I don't think I've, uh, I don't think the last time when I, I can't remember the last time when I laughed so much. And I probably can say that this is true for all our panelists. Uh, so thank you, uh, Justice Bhattacharya. Thank you, um, Kalpana, Vrinda, Anindita. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope to do this again. We hope we should all come back together for more discussion about ideas, institutions, and the celebration, you know, the, this carnival of uh, celebrating, uh, I mean, this carnival of uh, uh, you know, democracy uh, that we celebrate every year, uh, uh, you know, in, actually twice a year in November as well as in January. So thank you and uh, a big thank you to Live Law for organizing and managing this so efficiently. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank we you. enjoyed it immensely. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.